On today's toolbox, we'll continue modernizing classic Windows desktop apps. We'll show you how to add modern UI to them and connect to Microsoft 365 data. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today for part two of our two-part look at modernizing desktop applications is Adam Braden. Hey, Adam. Hello. How are you? Glad to be back. I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> You're back. We didn't leave, of course, <laughs> but people don't have to know that. That's right. In the previously on Visual Studio Toolbox, mm -hmm. we looked at packaging, improvements in packaging, desktop apps inside Windows 10. We looked at calling Win 10 APIs mm -hmm. in, in the code, and we also looked at a little bit, uh, very high level at .NET Core 3. Yeah, so just was, an introduction. Yeah, so that was kind of on the packaging code side. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about UI, mm -hmm. because last time anybody checked, uh, UWP apps had some pretty cool looking UI that we could possibly take advantage of. Um, and then we're going to look at graph, which is always a fun thing to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, with the Windows uh, platform over the last five, eight years, we've invested quite a bit in new UI and controls. Mm -hmm. The Fluent uh, design or Fluent controls, you'll hear a lot of talk about that uh, at Build and Ignite uh, and all of our tech conferences. But one of the challenges has been is that those controls you can't use in your Win32 applications, yeah. your .NET applications. Your tool set for the .NET developer has been pretty stagnant for the last eight to 10 years. Uh, and so with the new technology for XAML Islands, we've actually introduced a XAML host that you can now um, dynamically load mm -hmm. UWP controls inside of and get that fluent UI look and feel. Um, we've also introduced wrappers. Uh, so where we've actually done the plumbing work to create uh, the wrapper controls that hook up the events and the properties and methods and look um, and build the WinForms or WPF version of those UWP controls. Okay. And they talk to the, the um, platform version underneath the covers. So the on.NET show had an episode on XAML episodes, I believe, back in December. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want to repeat a lot of what they talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but give us kind of the high level overview of what it is and how it works sure. in terms of the actual mechanics and the plumbing. Sure. And then if folks want, more information, they can go watch that very good episode, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Okay. What is a XAML island? Um, it's code that sits alone, <laughs> and no one ever reaches it, right? Because it's out in the middle of the sea? Yeah. Probably not. Not right. <laughs> uh, not quite. Um, but essentially, you know, WinForms and WPF, the underlying technology is an HWINT. Mm -hmm. We all know and love that from the Win32 world. When the modern Windows platform for Windows 8 and Windows 10 was built, we tried to obfuscate or um, abstract that so we could take the windowing technology to different platforms that may or may not have something called an HWIND. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the concept underneath the covers there is a core window. What, um, what XAML Islands does is really kind of go under the covers, gets the HWIND that's backing a core window, allows those Win32 applications to host that content inside of an HWIND. Okay. And so if you're doing some low-level APIs, you would say, hey, here's my parent HWIND. Give me a child HWIND that can host XAML content. Mm. Okay. And what we've done is we've built a hosting control that does that for you, right? So that you as the developer don't have to do that. Is that a similar concept to how back in the early WPF days, we were able to take WPF controls and host them in a WinForm and WinForm controls and host them in a WPF. Is exactly. It, it's kind of the same concept. Hopefully, it's a little more elegant than it was back then because that was kind of clunky. Yeah. Um, well, that'll be it. We're, we're always open to feedback, <laughs> but there is okay. a similar model where, yeah, okay. you can interrupt between these different platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I have loaded here inside Visual Studio is actually a reference to the uh, uh, Microsoft Community Toolkit, and it hosts a, or creates a Windows XAML host control for you. Okay. And what I can do is, um, well, first let me show you. You can find these on NuGet. They're pretty easy if you search for Microsoft dot Toolkit. And uh, there's multiple. F there's a couple of versions. There's one for Forms or WinForms, Microsoft dot Toolkit dot Forms, and then there's one for uh, WPF, if you have a WPF app. Okay. So you can download and install those, and you can see right now I have the XAML host. 
-hmm. So that's just the container or the holder control. And you have to put all the content in there and manage the controls yourself or hook okay. them up yourself to events. And so that's what I wanted to show first was just kind of like, you know, here's the, the frame and let me dynamically load some content in there. So I can drag and drop the XAML host control on my form. And seem to have lost a little bit of content there. Uh, navigation. And so what I'm doing here in this code, let me go ahead and uncomment it out, is that I have a reference to Windows 10 and the APIs associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, remember in the last episode I managed message, or we talked about adding references to the, either the files on your SDK or the NuGet package. Right. You still need to have that reference so that you can um, uh, access the latest UWP controls. What I have here is I'm creating a Windows uh, XAML button. Okay. You got to create that control first. I set the various properties like height and width and content and I'm hooking up an event. Okay. And then lastly, I tell the host control what the child is. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you could build up more complex or, or dynamic content here. But if I um, uh, but when I run this, you'll see that I'll get a uh, empty container control, and when I click the button, we'll be able to load this XAML content into it. And so you can see the empty container control is kind of blank right now, but I've created a UWP control inside of it. Okay. So you said the XAML content, but I don't see any XAML yet. I see that you created the button in code. Right. It's rendering its UI. Okay. Uh, the, the rendering of the controls are in there. I could ask, could add any other XAML content or animations or whatever. Okay. Uh, for the purposes of this, I kind of wanted to show just uh, a simple set of controls okay. that we could add. Yep. But I could add a stack panel, set up some transitions, that sort of thing. That would require a little bit more code to hook all that up. Okay. Um, and what I got here is you can see that the I can hook up events as well. So I have a hosting control, hosting a XAML button, which fires an event that shows up in your WinForms code. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of like step one, like dynamically uh, creating content or controls and putting them in the XAML host control. Right. Uh, step two we talked about was the wrappers. We've created a number of wrappers for some of the high volume or high use or most requested controls. Things like the maps control, web view, if you need to host HTML5 content, uh, some of the media player controls as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's about six of those controls that we've created wrappers for. And what I wanted to show next was how to, um, uh, was show next how to access those and uh, show the differences in the web view type control. Here in my NuGet packages, I've got a few extra. Let me go ahead and close some of those. I'll look at the installed. I've got the uh, WebView control mm -hmm. as a NuGet package as well. It also has a dependency on the host. Uh, and I've also got a, the, uh, the Windows 10 contract, so I can call various APIs there. Um, in the form itself, You'll see on the left-hand side, I have a web browser control, mm -hmm. the good old IE web browser control. Now, that thing is ancient. It yeah. hasn't really kept up to standards. And so if you have internet sites or interface with a vendor and you need um, richer content versus HTML5, you're kind of stuck right now right. with your existing applications. There's no way to put that content into your app. Enter the web browser control, or the, excuse me, the web view control. Um, and so we'll see that uh, under the toolkit forms, you have a web view control mm -hmm. and a web view compatible. Uh, the web view compatible uh, gives you a similar API surface area. And on Windows 10, it lights up with the uh, edge version of the web view. And on lower level platforms, it can use the IE version okay. of, the, uh, of the control. So it allows you to have one surface and be able to work cross, cross browser. I uh, just got a simple button here which navigates the URL. The 
you can see that the object model is fairly similar. Mm -hmm. And so if I run this, oops, I forgot to set my startup project. Go back and set the startup project and run this control. And if we hit HTML5 test, we'll see that both controls loaded that page. And mm -hmm. on the left, you'll see that the uh, uh, IE-based control is, does not meet very strong uh, HTML5 standards, right. whereas the uh, web browser control is much richer for its HTML5 standard. Cool. And that's the case where all you have to do is drag and drop, place the control, and, yep. and navigate. Pretty simple and straightforward. Um, in the last episode, we also talked about, or we showed the coupon application right. to call various Windows 10 APIs. I had a scenario there in the coupon demo where uh, I thought it would be interesting to add a show inking. Yeah. Ink controls is the ink canvas uh, is one of the great controls. It provides a, um, a rich inking experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you could foresee using those in various tablet type applications where somebody's running around a warehouse and it's maybe easier to use a, a pen to mark things or sign stuff off than it is to do a little keyboard on a laptop or, right. or maybe even a touch based type device um, might be a little uh, cumbersome. Uh, and so ink content on your existing applications or maybe you want to really invest in sort of a drawing or, or type CAD type application. One of the things that I need to do here is um, enable the ink canvas for mouse to work. And so there's input device types that it supports. Mm -hmm. Mouse, pen, touch. Okay. Because uh, I don't have a pen with this laptop, unfortunately. Uh, so when I run this, And all I did there was drag and drop the ink canvas control down here in this signature pane. And what you'll see now is that I can easily ink Sweet. with my mouse. Nice. Right. So the ink canvas control, which you got from where? That was with the toolkit. I'll show you here in a second. Ah, so on the left okay. here, you'll see Got all the, the, there's the ink canvas, mm -hmm. the various toolbars, the map control, media player right. element, and you just drag and drop that onto your form. Okay, so you can take existing, you can take controls that are in, uh, that UWP folk would get automatically. Yes. And now use them in your WinForms and WPF apps pretty easily. Exactly. We've published these through the Windows Community Toolkit, mm -hmm. and so you can search for it. Uh, the source is on GitHub. Uh, and for the NuGet packages, you generally search on Microsoft.toolkit, and you'll see uh, the Forms version, the WPF version, uh, and any version there. Okay. So if I have some existing UI in a UWP app that mm -hmm. I want to, and I need to create a similar UI mm -hmm. in a WinForm or a WPF app, could be a login form, could be anything. But I've got sure. a bunch of existing XAML yeah. that I've already written in WPF that works yep. fine. Can I take that as a XAML island and call it from my desktop app? The um, dynamically creating the XAML, uh, I think there you'd want to create a control okay. uh, to expose that functionality. There are some current challenges with uh, XAML islands if you're creating a C-sharp XAML island and you want to use it in a C-sharp.net application, mm -hmm. there's some uh, restrictions on being able to do that. Generally, it works best if you have a native component and you put uh, and you build a native control ba based on with XAML under backing your thing, and then you can use it anywhere uh, with .NET okay. Framework or either other UWP applications. So you, you would create a, w, a UWP user control, yeah. and then use that in the application. Right, right. You wouldn't just put the XAML itself necessarily inside the desktop app. Um, yeah, I, I, we'll have to follow up with the XAML Islands okay. folks to get some more details there. Um, but most of the models we've seen is where you kind of build the control around okay. it itself. All right. So cool. 
Okay. Uh, so that was kind of the, the quick overview of using the XAML controls, the host control, and some of the wrapper controls. Mm -hmm. um, what next I wanted to talk about was the Microsoft Graph. And the graph uh, at a high level uh, is your organization's representation of all of its content in Microsoft 365 in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And it provides a single entry point to be able to program against your SharePoint, your users, you can even send mail and notifications. And there's really uh, dozens if not hundreds of different kind of objects or entities you can program against. Right. Uh, so it's basically you get to treat the data inside Office as data. Yes. And then you make RESTful API calls to go get that data. Right. As opposed to the automation model where you actually start up the app and then make it do things, or the, uh, the XML content model where you could read what's in a Word doc mm -hmm. as XML and then mm -hmm. parse through that, um, which was doable but a lot of steps and difficult. Now this is essentially make a RESTful API run mm -hmm. a query mm -hmm. to return me my email messages or what have you. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned the REST APIs, the REST APIs are the most full featured aspect of the, the graph to mm -hmm. access all that data up in the cloud. Uh, they also produce a graph SDK, yep. which provides a little bit easier object model to yeah. navigate and use. However, it doesn't quite uh, cover everything that's available versus REST. And uh, the folks over in the graph team are um, aware of that, and they're kind of they're always improving the SDK. Uh, from a client or desktop application perspective, uh, it may be easier to start with the SDK and start building out mm -hmm. until you run into a limitation, and then you could drop into the REST APIs right. to, to navigate and use that. Yep. Uh, one of the challenges that people run into, though, first of all, is just how do I connect to the graph? How do I even know who I am or what I am or what am I doing type right. of thing? And so um, what we've done with the Windows Community Toolkit is built a handful of helper controls that wrap some of the graph SDK functionality and provide a drag drop experience to, to do that. Um, what I will bring up here is the uh, Windows Community Toolkit sample app. You mm -hmm. can download this from the store uh, if you just search on Windows Community Toolkit and install it. And it provides a ton of uh, services that, um, to help you get started with Windows applications and make it easier to program against. Mm -hmm. But one of the main ones that for this topic is the graph controls. And you can see that there's a, a login control, uh, which helps you log in with your application, a people picker to see the people in the organization, uh, various SharePoint and Power BI functionality, um, profile cards, and a SharePoint list. We're obviously trying to figure out you know, what people want to use and what they need help with or they think should be better encapsulated. So you can always give feedback to the toolkit team as to like, hey, it really seems like this functionality is missing or mm -hmm. it'd be better to um, uh, wrap this in some manner. So if I start with the uh, toolkit control, I'll show the app here and then I'll show some code in, of what it looks like, but it's a little easier to explore things this way. Um, the login control essentially has just a client ID and then the set of permissions you're requesting from the graph. Uh, I'm not going to go into registering your app in the cloud. That's a, a very Azure talk, uh, navigating all that UI. Um, we'll have a, uh, if needed, I think we can do a follow-up or follow-up talk on that okay. or if you've already done it with someone else. But you can register you your app in the cloud. Dev.office.com. It's actually pretty straightforward yeah. to, to register the app and get the ID. Apps.dev.microsoft.com is okay. the one I was familiar with. All right. Okay. <laughs> and that's the other challenge. There's a few different entry points, which is yeah. confusing. But you get an ID, and then that says, for my organization, I can use this application. Mm -hmm. Now, when I click on this, it's going to prompt me for my login information. Oh, I didn't remember who I was. At m365.322536.1 Hopefully, I remembered this. Uh, I'm logging into a sample, a tenant that mm -hmm. I've created. It's pre-populated with a few dozen users and some content. 
Uh, and so here I am, I've logged in as Megan, mm -hmm. and the login control will automatically do all the plumbing and connection for you so that you don't have to write a lot of REST calls and, and stuff to manage this. Um, it also provides some UI to get your information about mm -hmm. the user, and you can switch whatever the profile, uh, profile is that you want. Right? Another example control to show that we are connected to the graph and we get more than just a single user back is I can, you know, uh, pick different people. It mm -hmm. goes out, makes a REST call to search the organization and return me a list of people. And now I can save those people to my, uh, to a list. And I can add them and maybe send an email or something like that to them. Cool. So we're constantly building and augmenting these controls. We have a few SharePoint ones as well. My, unfortunately, my tenant doesn't have a lot of SharePoint stuff, so I won't be able to demo that. But what I did want to do is show you how to use this from an application. Currently, these controls are only available in UWP. We're working on what the model is or the right way to expose them to Win32 or .NET. Okay. Um, if you recall in the last episode, or earlier I mentioned that uh, there's some challenges with managed UWP code and managed .NET code working together. And um, that's kind of the limitation we're working with right here. Whereas Windows platform controls, like your buttons and your stack panels and whatnot, are written in native code, mm -hmm. and those work fine on top of .NET. These graph controls are written in managed code, and so there's some uh, technical challenges we have to figure out in order to get them to work inside of uh, uh, .NET Framework. Okay. So I will close this, and I will bring up um, my sample projects here. Set the graph as the startup. And let's go explore the graph one here. First of all, I want to uh, show you the NuGet packages as well. If I look at the installed one, um, what I'm showing right here is just a .NET application. And while we've created UWP controls, uh, we did create one small WinForms component that wraps the authentication aspect of it. So you mm -hmm. can at least log in and then get a hold, to, hold of the graph, graph, service, um, graph service object and be able to make graph SDK calls at that point. Okay. So if you install the toolkit services, it includes a few different services, but the main one is graph. And uh, when I bring up the form, you'll see that there's a graph login component. Yep. I've already dragged and dropped it onto the, the panel here. And as I mentioned, we don't have, um, uh, in WinForms or Win32, we don't have the controls. So I kind of built my own little profile card. Here's a picture and a couple of labels. Okay. And then a login button that says login. The component itself just takes two input parameters, the ID. This is the same ID as I used to log in with the uh, for the sample purposes of the community toolkit mm -hmm. and the rights or scopes that I'm requesting. And once it returns, then I can um, set up some values for the return. So I run that and we choose login. It's gonna ask me for these things. This time it remembered on this app yeah, exactly. that I've logged in with Megan B. Mm -hmm. sign in, and now we can see I've got Megan's information cool. logged in. Cool, cool. So um, that's kind of a small component that we at least allow you to easily log in uh, to the application. One of the things that you might want to do in your code at that point, though, is, uh, is get access to the Graph SDK client. And we provide, once you've logged in, Let's go graph login component one dot graph service client. So that's the property mm -hmm. that gets you access to the SDK. And so now you can say GSC client. And you can start exploring the different parts of the graph. Like you have your contracts here, devices. A lot of these you may have to request additional scopes to actually yeah. access them, or you'll get some sort yeah. of uh, um, permission denied error. Um, but it really does, con a lot of the device and drive user. Drive lets you get at and read what's in OneDrive. Yep. 
Um, you got mail in there. Groups, cool. SharePoint information, yep. planning information, reports, mm -hmm. my SharePoint sites, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And cool. users, right? That's yep. how it was the, the people picker was working, was querying based on the users right. and workbooks. So, um, we do have a few, couple of websites and some additional content you can access. Uh, I take one moment if I search on uh, graph, yeah, Microsoft.com. We can go to the Graph Explorer, and that allows you to query all the content that's in the graph. Yep. Uh, you've probably already covered something like this, but I also like the Getting Started docs. And you can search down here. If you search on UWP, it provides you some quick starts on how to build an application, download the SDK. And then a little bit lower is the repositories. Right. Here's one, a repository that uses those graph controls that we showed you so you can uh, really analyze the code. Yep. Uh, and then you can take the, the toolkit. Even though it's in a UWP app, you can take that code and then put it in your WinForm app once you get access to the graph. Yeah, these, client, um, that right? would probably be more on the SDK samples. Right. Yeah, the right. SDK samples yep. you could easily copy over. And right. once you've got that client, you can access them inside WinForms. Right. And WPF. Yep. Cool. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a very big and very interesting topic, mm -hmm. um, the graph. It's, it's like, a, you know, we've been doing office development for a while, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it was VBA or VSTO. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like the, finally the promise of just being able to query for the data mm -hmm. um, in a fairly straightforward manner. Yeah, one entry of, point to get yeah. access to all these different services. Right. Yeah, it's, it's very, very cool stuff. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah, so I, we've covered, you know, the five areas we think of in terms of modernization, and we'll continue to expand on these concepts and build more. If there's any functionality that you think is missing, customers out there, let us know. We're definitely open for feedback, and uh, uh, I guess happy modernizing. Yeah, and, and, the, <laughs> and the cool thing, that the key takeaway is that in order to modernize, you don't have to redo the UI. Right? right. We've done all of these things from a uh, existing old school WinForms app. You can and you can certainly do it from UWP as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much. Cool. Hope you enjoyed that, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.